Stay hungry, stay foolish. Do you ever feel overwhelmed and powerless after watching the news? Does it make you feel sad about the world without much hope for its future? Take a breath. The world is not as bad as the headlines would have you believe. Today's guest has spent the last 10 years researching the damaging impact of the negativity bias in the news on our mental health and the health of our society, as well as investigating the impact of solutions-focused news. Her widely cited research has made her an influential figure within the movement for constructive journalism. As a partner at the Constructive Journalism Project, she writes for established and emerging news platforms, speaks on panels with leading thinkers, academics, and journalists. We welcome author of You Are What You Read, Jody Jackson. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to have you on the show, Jody. And I thought a great way to start, I felt, was with some context to why you wrote this book. And I quote this from your introduction of the book, where you say, I could understand that the world had its flaws, but I did not and could not agree with the picture that I was being given by reading the news. I came to realize it was not me, but the news industry that was damaged. I didn't always feel so strongly. It was a gradual progression that moved me from being someone who watched the news daily, almost obsessively, to someone who could no longer stand it. So let's elaborate on that sentiment, Jody, because it really shows where you're coming from with this book. I watched the news daily, almost obsessively at some point. And I got to the point I found myself that it was, you know, it was too depressing. I couldn't tune in anymore. And there's a real pressure in society to be informed through the news. You know, it doesn't matter how well educated you are in other ways. If you're not tuned into the news, people consider you to be naive or ignorant. And so the reaction that people had towards me when I stopped watching the news made me feel that I was damaged in some way, you know, that there was something in me that wasn't strong enough or brave enough to see the world in all of its ugly existence as, as the picture I was being given by the news. And when I then began to try and understand my own experience better and also understand a collective experience, you know, I realized this wasn't just me. I went back to university. I investigated over a century's worth of research about the impact of the negativity bias on the news on our mental health. And I found that this was a widespread problem that a lot of people were facing. And when I realized that it wasn't an individual thing, it was a collective one, I realized that it wasn't actually me that was damaged. It was the news industry that was damaged. And, and that's why I really wanted to create my work around building a more constructive narrative that helps many, many more people engage and have a better understanding of the condition of the world. It really spoke to me as well, because I'd be in that camp where I limit my intake of the news. I like to know what's going on, but I don't like to obsess about it because I do feel it can drag you down. And you tell us you discovered solution-focused news by rejecting your most immediate desire to switch off. And instead of choosing ignorance, you found more positive stories. You know, I find beautiful serendipities happen the whole time for me with this show. And I had on last week the brilliant Dr. Tina Payne Bryson. And she was talking about how we should share positive stories that come out of this COVID-19 pandemic that we're experiencing, the stories of collaboration and community to our children, because we don't want to leave our children with a negative memory of this pandemic and that we can flip that around quite a bit. And I found that really, really was beautiful serendipity for your work, because I was reading your book just after talking to Tina. There's sort of two things to glean from that. I think absolutely, I think being able to kind of experience firsthand the kindness and compassion of humanity has been a really important narrative that we don't often see because, you know, through the mainstream media, we're often given the worst version of ourselves presented back to us. And I think there's been a really nice opportunity through social media predominantly, but perhaps curated through some news organizations that have actually been able to demonstrate what we're able to to do individually and collectively when we care. Um, so I think that's been really nice. But more importantly, you know, this isn't a blip of something that we can either think back on as negative or positive. This is a reality that there's a lot to learn from. And I think where solutions journalism comes into play and where this is actually a really valuable situation for us, um, and I'm not undermining the kind of horror that I'm sure a lot of people are facing, both economically and um, in their health as well, but we know 
that there are countries doing this better than us. You know, we can look to Asia and see how Taiwan, South Korea, Hong Kong, Singapore have been so effective in containing and controlling the spread of the virus. And one of the reasons is because they experienced SARS back in 2003. So they've had, they've experienced firsthand a kind of viral pandemic that's required the technological and social and, and health infrastructure to be built around containing it. And they were better prepared at this particular moment in time. And hopefully this will be something that's now seared into our history where we've created our own learning curve to be able to better equip ourselves for when and inevitably we face something like this in the future. So whilst there are negatives that I'm sure a lot of people are facing in the current situation, it's not necessarily just about finding the silver lining. It's also about really understanding how this is going to allow us to progress uh, legitimately as a society going forward. I'm going to jump ahead a little bit in my notes here because you mentioned later on in the book, Lara Satrakian, a former journalist at ABC News and her expose on the reporting of the Ebola outbreak in 2014. I found this so alike to what we're experiencing now because it reminded me of the current situation with COVID-19. Yeah, well, she spoke about the way in which the news coverage of the Ebola crisis actually exacerbated the situation. And the World Health Organization included the intense media coverage in its list of factors that accelerated the crisis. And this is because a lot of people didn't necessarily get the correct information on a ground level of what they could do about it and how to protect themselves because of the sensationalized nature in the coverage. Where you had many countries who were terribly affected by it. You had kind of the sweeping death rates of Liberia, Guinea, Sierra Leone. What you didn't have was a narrative about how Mali, Senegal, and Nigeria were highly effective in their response to the virus and managed to contain its spread to fewer than 30 cases collectively. And when um, the first case was reported in Senegal, the newspapers reported, you know, first case found in Senegal and then it was littered with the kind of neighboring death toll statistics of Liberia, Guinea, and Sierra Leone. But what we didn't see is that in very few news organizations, we didn't see that actually Senegal only had one case. And the way in which they contained it was they got the authorities, they got the government, they got people involved, you know, they monitored, they tested, they connected with the wider community of who that person who was found to have Ebola who had actually connected with it, which it was 74 people they identified as potential carriers of the virus, and then they tested all of them. And they really stayed on top of it. And there's a huge lesson to be learned there. But that wasn't the kind of coverage that was dominating the headlines at the time. You know, we were learning what's not working rather than what is. And the problem with that as a general narrative that our news tends to focus on is it's a very slow way to learn. And in real time, we should be looking at where countries are doing it well and understanding the methods and techniques being used so that we can learn from them and hopefully be able to replicate them if they're replicable. And if they're not necessarily present in our current timeline, look back at history. You know, we can look back at the Ebola coverage. We can look back at SARS. We can look at what's worked in previous pandemics. And so there's a real value in widening the media lens, not to ignore the problem. We absolutely need to know about the problem, but we're doing ourselves a huge disservice if we don't fully understand how this problem can be resolved. One of the things that dawned on me and why I reached out to you was we can really impact people's worldviews here. And we talk a lot about worldviews on this show, Jody. And in that respect, this line I pulled from the book, I find brilliant. You said, the information we consume through the news becomes our basis for understanding the world. This then creates a filter through which we see things and influences how we feel, talk about, and respond to global, local, and even personal challenges. We habitually mimic the views of the news we watch and read. These stories shape our knowledge, beliefs, and opinions. And this is precisely how I feel about the news around COVID-19. It's a nonstop barrage of negativity, and you can literally feel the fear in the air. And one of the things that I'm so wary of is impacting our children because you're impacting the next generation we are adults we can control a certain amount our fear and our worldviews but we're really impacting those worldviews and that's why i mentioned tina payne bryson last week because she was saying we need to tell our children the good stories as well yes grounded in reality let them know it this is serious but 
some of the beautiful stories of collaboration community that come out of it. I'd love if you shared a bit about the psychology of this and the worldviews that are formed. Absolutely. I mean, what the news does really is it connects us with realities that we're unable to experience firsthand. And it also helps us make sense of the ones that we do. So, you know, we're not living in isolation, just speaking to our friends and family in this current situation. News coverage and news consumption has never actually been higher. So there's a huge input, an informational input in helping us contextualize what we're experiencing on an individual level. And the problem with the way in which the majority of the news covers this is it is ticking up death tolls minute by minute, counting cases minute by minute. And we know that this is a problem that's going to exponentially grow unless we intervene and do something about it, because that's just the way in which it unfolds. And so there's not a huge amount of value necessarily tuning into that again and again, repeatedly reinforcing the fact that this is a problem that we're facing. Where you would perhaps get more of a benefit would be to kind of tune out a little bit as well. Give yourself some time in between the information that you're consuming. Be deliberate about the way that you're consuming it. So you're not just necessarily being fed the kind of low hanging fruit stories of death tolls and cases. But where, where we focus on the kind of extreme and the extraordinary cases, like a 13 year old child dying as a result of this or an 102 year old woman surviving this is you're taking the extreme and the extraordinaries and they, they kind of seem like they're normal and ordinary. And it creates an informational hazard because neither of these two things are really reflective of the problem that we're facing. Older people are at threat and younger people aren't as much. So whilst you can take these stories and share them, they shouldn't necessarily be breaking news as if this is the latest that we're now facing because it's not really. Um, and so it's making sure when you're reporting on the problem that it's put into perspective and context. And we're actually shown, you know, where does this feature in the wider story? How does this make us understand the issue better? And I actually posted something about this today, giving a warning on Instagram of just saying prolonged exposure to bad news over a long period of time can have detrimental effects on our well-being because it can make us feel anxious, pessimistic and depressed. And these feelings linger even when we switch off from the news because we become so well rehearsed at feeling them. And you can think of it like making a mark on a piece of paper. So this mark might be so faint that it's not even noticeable when you do the first line. But as you go over it again and again and again, even with the slightest of pressure, that line becomes more permanent and more defined. And that helps explain why our feelings grow stronger and last for longer. And we're also marking a feeling of helplessness. So we develop this defeatist attitude where these problems just seem too big to solve. And so we can stop trying and that leads to a reduction in our helpful behavior. But our reduced efforts to help can also be explained because of an increase in feelings of contempt and hostility towards other people or other groups of people in society. And another reason that we might actually become less helpful is because we just become desensitized. You know, we do become very used to hearing about these stories of tragedy, crisis and violence, and we kind of come to expect them. And so they lose their shock value. And ultimately, um, you know, people can just switch off from the news altogether to try and avoid these feelings. So there are and these when I sort of say this, you know, these aren't the effects of watching just one news story about one problem. It's the effects of the continuous and excessive reporting of problems over a long period of time without a balanced understanding of what's being done about them. So there are real harmful consequences, both psychologically and sociologically, because of the kind of behavioral response that it brings about, that having this very, very negative narrative has, because that becomes our basis of thinking, it forms our worldview, and then it dictates, or at least certainly contributes significantly towards our actions. You asked the question. In the last 20 years, has global poverty either doubled, remained the same, or fallen by half? And I just want to pause and I'll let you give the answer to our audience here, but just again for our audience, in the last few years, to test your beliefs, has, in the last 20 years, has global poverty A, doubled, B, remained the same, or C, fallen by half? Okay. Now I'm going to hand it over to you now, Jody, to give the answer to this and the surprising statistics that come out of this question. So the answer is that it's, it's actually fallen by half. And so if you were one of the people that got this right, you'd be one of 7% of people when asked who actually got this question correct. 
the other 93% of people thought that it had either doubled or remained the same. And this highlights the kind of systemic ignorance that we have from reading the news, because the presentation of it is so bad that there's often this gap between reality and perception of reality, where we often believe that the world is a much worse place than it actually is because we're shown the worst of it continually. So I think it was Mark Twain who said, if I don't read the newspaper, I'm uninformed. And if I read the newspaper, I'm ill-informed. And it's exactly that, really. You know, we, we kind of take these educated guesses on things that we don't necessarily have deep knowledge of. And because of the negative filter that we seem to have on the world, we just assume things are worse than they actually are. And um, the other kind of reason that we can have this is because problems tend to be very quick, explosive, and they have impact immediately, whereas solutions tend to be kind of slow, trend-led, data-driven. They take more time. Um, and so they don't necessarily make it onto that kind of breaking news agenda. But when we actually do look at the statistics, we can become aware that the world is actually perhaps in a much better condition than we think. And this isn't to say that it's rid of problems. There are still certainly things that need addressing, but we can recognize that progress has taken place and that a problem still exists. I was really upset because I asked my son that he's 10 and he said that he thinks things have got worse mm. and it's because of the COVID like he's watching the news now and, and you don't want to deny that you don't want to deny the reality of the situation but at the same time I keep balancing out by going you know the amazing things are happening throughout the world people are collaborating innovations happening because people have to innovate etc cetera, etc cetera, just to balance out the reality of it all and i think this is one of the key messages you come across with in the book but you remind us how difficult it is to remove bias from reporting and we're all human so we all have biases built into us for positive reasons and you mentioned the well-known u.s broadcaster edward murrow and how he famously said that the news must hold a mirror behind the nation and the world and more importantly the mirror must have no curves and must be held with a steady hand in practice, however, the mirror that is being held has all sorts of subtle curves and a fair few not-so-subtle dents. Well, it's governed by the idea that the news is kind of dictated by a fairly depressing mantra of if it bleeds, it leads. And negativity has become one of the dominant selective criteria for whether or not a story is considered newsworthy. You know, when you speak to people about solutions-focused news, they consider it, well, that's not news because it's not a problem. And that colors much of the coverage that we have. And so if you are holding a mirror to the world, what we've got through that mantra of if it bleeds, it leads, is we've got a magnification of these stories of problems, war, disaster, corruption, murder, famine, um, and you know natural disasters like the pandemic that we're facing. And they're magnified. And this fills our television screens, our social media, our newspapers. And this becomes all that we see because at the same time, it minimizes and ignores stories of progress, peace building, development and solutions. And so this gives us a very distorted reflection of the world. And as a result, it gives us a very distorted understanding of it. And it's not to say that these problems don't exist. They do. But we are completely overwhelmed by how many there are, how big they are, and how unsolvable they seem. Because they, we're not really told about how they're solved, they're just forgotten about. Because when they're not a problem anymore, they're not on the agenda anymore. Um, and so it's really making sure that we're including the other part of the narrative, You know, widening the lens, taking a longer term view on an issue. In journalism, you have the who, what, where, when, why, and that usually governs how you report on a problem. And what we then say is, well, what next? What's happened? How has it been resolved? Um, and it might not be, you know, it's not saying that a situation's gone from bad to good. It's about acknowledging that progress is taking place and it is possible. And it might be limited, it might be flawed, it might be excellent, but there's a story there to be investigated that we're currently not doing as well as we should be. Let's share an example of the phenomenon you mentioned known as agenda setting theory, because I love what you do in the book. You lay out all these theories, psychological theories, et cetera, to, to show actually how this all affects us and how it all comes together. And you give the example in the US, how crime news tripled between 1992 and 1993. And by 1994, 
it was actually more dominant than news about the economy, healthcare reform, and midterm elections combined. And this created a perception that crime was increasing and had an enormous impact on public opinion. And that public opinion creates a lot of pressure on policy. And as a result, you know, the US created more prisons than any other country and has more people behind bars as a result than any other country. And I think that what the news decides for us to be talking about nationally will then dictate legislation, you know, where we put our resources, where we put our attention, because it does create pressure. And that's something that it's good for, you know, it absolutely should. But when we're not necessarily matching the reality with the stories that we're telling about reality, it might misplace that threat. And we actually might be concerned more about something that doesn't necessarily require as much as our, as, as of our attention as something else that we should be more concerned about. But it tends to, you know, I, I think the other thing that I mentioned is people's fear of flying because you see in the news, you know, the kind of horrific crashes that can sometimes happen increasingly and frequently, but you know, you're given so much horrific information about it and you're kind of given backstories of the people and there's a relatability because we all fly and we might be 29 and that was one of the victims and we might be 50 with three kids and that was one of the victims, you know, and they draw this kind of story out when actually we're much more at threat from getting in our car in the morning. And that's something that we don't necessarily talk about road safety of how to improve it where we talk about improving aviation safety. And it's not to say that, you know, we should not worry about aviation safety because obviously we should, but it's about fully understanding the risks um, and making sure that we have an appropriate level of pressure for what is genuinely a threat to us and what is perhaps less of a threat to us. And one of the things that's very relatable was when you mentioned how many grandparents today worry about their grandchildren because they see the world as this really dangerous place because of the amount of reporting, the amount of social media, the amount of access to news. And they feel that the world has become more dangerous for children and less fun, etc. Even though many of those grandparents themselves grew up in post-World War or even in during World War itself. I know, it was my, my, my mother-in-law. She, you know, when I had my first daughter, She said, you know, that she worried about the world that she was going to have to grow up in because it's so much more dangerous than when she was young. And she was born in Germany during the World War. She was separated from her family through the Berlin Wall. And it astonishes me that she's concerned about the fortunate circumstances that my daughter has been brought into the world. And it is astonishing because, you know, we have better IQ, better technology, better sanitation fewer mortalities, infant mortalities, you know, there's a level of indicators to suggest that life has significantly improved over the last 70 years. But that's not reflected in in people's worldview, because their understanding of the world is that it's gotten much worse. But it's because we're told about the worst of the world frequently. And especially over the last 30 years, with the accelerated pace of media, we've come to see these problems as being accelerating themselves. It's not. We just have much faster access to them and sort of much more widely accessible points to be able to understand about them. So it's that gap between reality and perception. And I think before, this was a statistic that I had just before the Brexit polls, um, but the I think 71% of Britons believe that the world had gotten worse in the last 70 years. And that's staggering. You know, that is huge. And it dictates the kind of decisions that we made, especially when we're asked to participate in a democratic society, you know, where our worldviews and our concerns actually matter when it comes to a ballot box. And then you get leaders promising a restoration of the good old days, which never existed because we are better now than we were then. We're just perhaps less accommodating of the kind of progress that has been made. And we're less appreciative of, you know, at the point of when we were talking about Brexit, you know, I think the politicians, some of the more successful politicians in the campaigning were saying how they'd had enough of experts, or we've all had enough of experts, who now have kind of shown themselves to be invaluable to the progression of society, because we're all relying on them now to be able to help us through this crisis. So I think that 
we maybe got complacent with how much we really should be valuing what needs to be valued in society. And I think, yeah, hopefully this might redirect a bit more appreciation for people who can contribute constructively to the well-being of our society. Yeah, and one of the things that you made me think of there is how when we're in a state of fear, we're actually less intelligent because our bodies opt for survival over thrival. So we actually, our blood flow gets directed from our brain to our hands for fight or our feet for flight. And, and we actually become less intelligent, you know, and then regulation changes or policies slip through that would have taken years before to slip through. And stuff like you mentioned about, you know, the law and regulation and stricter regulations, etc. But one of the things, um, before we move into a couple of examples that you give, and one of them you give on Brexit itself, I'd love to share what Irving Goffman, arguably one of the best and most influential sociologists of the 20th century, called the schemata of interpretation, because this is really helpful. Well, it's about taking raw data and making it meaningful. So it's about taking, you know, everybody relies on the news or should be able to rely on the news to be a kind of fact-based information output that helps us understand the world. And they sort of claim objectivity and they kind of, you know, just pass one reality over to us untouched of their kind of experience, which is completely flawed and I would argue doesn't exist. I think the ideals of it should be up, upheld. And, but, you know, I think we should all be able to recognize the limitations of objectivity in the newsroom. Um, and part of that is the fact that they have to make content engaging. So there's a kind of storytelling structure to taking information and then presenting it in a way that's accessible to a wider population and making it kind of meaningful and giving it a narrative and an arc. We've got to kind of be aware that there is a production process to the news. It's not just a raw reality dictated by someone and then presented back to us. There is a process of production. There are editors that it goes through. There is A and B testing with headlines to see in the first five minutes which gets the most attention and then that's the one that they run with. There is continuous audience engagement analysis to be able to make sure that what they're producing is what people want to be reading. There's an enormous amount of work that goes into the news as a product rather than as a public service. And so as news consumers, we should all be aware of that to be able to perhaps help us A, make better choices about quality of information that we're getting and also protect ourselves psychologically to be able to have a, a healthy level of distance from the information that we're receiving. One of the things there you mentioned was negativity bias. So we do naturally tend to see the negative. Our brains work with ancient architecture. So the architecture of the brain is only 200,000 years since we were living in caves. And we still use that architecture. For example, when we came across something sweet as a caveman, we gorged on it because it wasn't in abundance and how many industries have used this ancient architecture against us, selling us sweet products over and over, knowing that we get addicted to it. But equally, we have a negativity bias, which is baked into us from a protective perspective. And this is also taken advantage from a news perspective. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we do have a very strong pull towards negative information because it kind of helps us become aware of the threats that we're facing and it helps keep us safe. So there is, you know, it is helpful. But when we have too much of it, it moves from being helpful to becoming harmful. So whereas it was adaptive, it then becomes maladaptive. And this is exactly what we're seeing with the news at the moment because we have, this isn't a scarce piece of information that we need to be able to act on for the sake of our survival. It's kind of, pushed past the point of that to overwhelm where it does create these more maladaptive psychological experiences such as anxiety, paranoia, fear, you mentioned before, and you're absolutely right. You know, fear is a very unhelpful response. Concern is good. Fear might be good in doses when it requires immediate action, but if it doesn't, then all that does is make us habitually more selfish because it's a very self-protective emotion. And so we actually care less about other people and the problems that they can be facing as a result. So all of these things that kind of come about from having an excess is a very short-sighted goal from the news industry to be able to increase profitability and increase engagement, but it is actually causing social and psychological harm. Just to note as well, because everyone is aware of how important fear is in our survival, and it absolutely is, and you know, everyone kind of says bad news sells, but optimism is just as important 
as our psychological makeup for our kind of, you know, well-being and survival as fear is. It's what's helped us progress as a society. It's what's helped us actually live for tomorrow. It's helped us be able to build futures beyond just the immediate. Optimism is a hugely creative and powerful tool in helping us actually build a better future. We don't just need to run away from the threat. We also need to run towards the opportunity. There's a very complex relationship between the two. And you can't just focus on one because in either case, if you just focus on fear or you just focus on optimism, you're naive either way. So, you know, people tend to lump optimists as being naive as if it was kind of a flaw in an otherwise reasonable person. But it's not, you know, it's a necessary component of our psychological makeup that enables us to be able to survive as much as fear does. And so it's really important that we feed it with the information that it needs to be able to do what it needs to be able to do to make the world better. I'll come back to solutions-based journalism in a second, but I just mentioned one of the headlines that kind of highlights this way of focusing on the negatives came in the Brexit campaign. And you share this example, you say, From the Mail Online on the 3rd of April 2016, the headline read, Report shows the NHS is nearly at breaking point as a massive influx of EU migrants forces doctors to take on 1.5 million extra patients in just three years. That had to be retracted by the news organization that printed it because it was significantly misleading. Because the actual, when you look at the data, the reason for the increase in patients in the NHS at that time was because of an aged population. So the fact that our healthcare was actually better, people were living for longer, it was putting additional stress on the NHS. And they actually had to change the headline afterwards. I can't remember exactly what it was too, but it was kind of the same version with a just so they say, which gave them the kind of loophole to not actually have to be fact-based. The problem with it as well is when you get a retraction from a very, very misleading headline like that, is it's usually on page two or three or four or five, and it's given a much smaller space. There's very little accountability. You've got IPSO, which is one of the press regulating bodies, which is incredibly ineffective. It's a very kind of self-regulated industry, which, as we all know, with any other industry, just wouldn't be acceptable. And the media act as a watchdog on society, really, to be able to keep in check news organizations who are abusing their power. But unfortunately, there's nobody who is keeping a check on them. And that's why I'm so passionate about the need for consumers to play a role in this because supply will follow demand. And you can see that with any industry that's gone through a kind of sustained shift towards a more positive purpose, whether it's our war on plastic or whether it's the kind of food revolution from just increased knowledge. Look at yoga. You know, that was 20 years ago, even considered a fairly hippie practice. Um, with a stereotyped person of wearing sandals and hugging trees. And now it's practiced by 20 million Americans daily because when people become aware of the benefits and the harmful consequences of something over a longer term period, you know, they're able to push past their immediate desires to be able to create better decisions for themselves in the long term. And the news is no different. So I think that once people aware become aware of the impact that the news has on them, Um, they're able to move from being consumers to becoming conscious consumers. And there's a real powerful role that conscious consumers can play in actually forcing industry to change and where the news industry is so poorly regulated. um, And I understand why, because of freedom of speech and everything else that comes with the the liberty of being in a democratic society. um, But whilst there is harm being done and very little resolve to it, I think we all have a part not only to protect ourselves, but be able to contribute to wider change within the industry and and the community. You beautifully articulated why I do this show is to shine a light on information that I believe doesn't get enough limelight. So thank you for that. (laughs) Just one of the things you mentioned there was the retractions, for example, that headline. And you tell us that even when there are retractions or corrections of inaccuracies, they are relatively ineffective because our brain is biased towards the first piece of information we are presented with known as anchoring effect. And this is really detrimental because we kind of go, oh yeah, well, where there's smoke, there's fire, or maybe we won't ever see the retraction in because of what you said that's on page two. Absolutely. There's the risk that you might not see it. And we are, we are geared, you know, there's an element, you can only really move so far away psychologically from the first piece of information that you get. So even if even if it gets proven to be untrue, there's an element, you, you know, there's an element of truth considered 
And whether that's done consciously, you know, whether you decide to give it additional thought or whether it's not, it's still filtered in there so that when you're then thinking about these things and perhaps getting a question like we asked, what are the biggest strains on the NHS? That piece of information will probably just pop into your head without you even realizing, without you forgetting that it was or wasn't true. It's there in there somewhere. It layers your outlook at some point, whether or not you need that information now or whether you'll need it ever. It's in there. And so it's really important, you know, that we're deliberate and conscious about what we actually allow through as much as we can be. Let's switch to the positives now, because you do a lot of work on the positives. You work in that industry and you say reporting can change the world, shining a light on important issues from Ellen DeGeneres coming out to the Catholic Church's abuse scandals. And I love the line you said, the press can act as both watchdog and guide dog helping us to understand issues and aspire to something better. When you speak to journalists in the research that I've done about why they've wanted to go into the industry, it's incredible. You know, it is incredible the amount of people that say to improve the condition of the world, to give a voice to the voiceless, to make the world better in some way, to put pressure on people, organizations, government, to be able to improve policy. There's there's an ideal there. You know, people don't just go into the news because they like storytelling. They want to be able to contribute to constructive change in the world. And the trouble is they're incredibly limited by just focusing on problems. It's not a very ineffective way about bringing progress because it has led to some of the most important movements of our time. We need to feel a sense of anger and injustice for things to want to change. But we also need the kind of information that allows us to believe if we put effort into it, that it will change. We have to be able to see that progress is taking place. And we have to be able to learn from how it's being done well so that we can get there quicker at the same time. The book that you're talking about where I took those examples from is a book by Roger Streitmatter called A Force for Good. And it really can be. But in his book, he talks about problems-focused journalism like the expose of the Catholic Church. And he talks about the media coverage of things like Ellen DeGeneres coming out as gay, allowing society and helping society create a narrative that, you know, helped the whole LBGT movement and you know granted it's been slow but it's helped it move towards a point of progress and so it's it's recognizing the role that it can be both you know when you talk about solutions and problems focused news people pit them against each other as if they're in competition you know when you talk about the value of solutions people implicitly think that you're saying that reporting on problems is bad and it's not it's just recognizing the limitations of it as an effective way to be able to create constructive change in the world and looking at other ways in which we can inform people about the reality of what's going on in the world and help them aspire to something better as well. You know, not just move away from something terrible, but help us move towards something better. And there's a real role there to help mobilize us. And I think it was Martin Luther King Jr. who said, you know, you have to use that anger as a transforming force. And in order to do that, you really need hope. You have to believe that the future can be better than the past. Because otherwise, that anger can be channeled into more destructive emotions like rage, which has a much more deconstructive consequence for reality. Before we finish up, let's share what solutions journalism is. First, by sharing what it is not, Jody, which is what you do in the book, and then perhaps share some successful examples. And then we'll finish up with the six effective ways we can change our media diet for the better. Yeah, we always kind of have to say what it's not because it's had a very long held, fluffy reputation. So we're not talking about lighthearted, entertaining, feel-good stories. There is a place for them, like you mentioned with your guest last week about sharing nice stories of people doing nice things. But what we're talking about here from a news perspective, it's rigorous journalism that reports critically on tangible progress being made in order for us to understand how issues are being dealt with. So we still learn about the problem, but we also learn about how these problems are being resolved, what people are doing in response to them what solutions are being put in place, and then we ask if they're working. And this isn't for the purpose of making us feel better, it's for the purpose of making us know better by giving us a fuller and more accurate picture of the world. So it's not necessarily so much about the people, it's more about the processes. You know, what are the mechanics that are driving real systemic change in society? And are they replicable? Are they scalable? Is the problem that they're facing here the same as the problem we're facing there? You know, can we learn from each other? That's really the kind of premise behind what solutions journalism is. And there are some 
news organizations that are fantastically building platforms to be able to share these stories. And they're showing that there's an audience for them and they're showing that they can monetize them. And there's a list on my website, jodyjackson.com. There's a starter kit. So if you are interested in finding some of these news organizations, then you can find them there. And I also send around a newsletter every week of just some of the best stories that I've found through this kind of starter kit where there are responses to social problems. So whether it's about the progress being made in the face of the current pandemic that we're facing or any other area that is seeing some kind of progress taking place. Then when it comes to us personally, you mentioned there's six effective ways we can change our media diet in a way that will help us become more informed, engaged and empowered. I'd love if you'd cover these six at a very top level. The first is to be a conscious consumer. And this is something that I mentioned before, you know, unless we are conscious about the way in which we consume the news, we won't necessarily have the kind of control over our mental health and our worldview um, because it's going to be given to us. So we have to be very deliberate and decide, you know, we have to decide the who, what, where, when, why um, that we're going to pay attention to. Um, the second one is to read or watch good quality journalism. And this is because the quality of the input is going to kind of dictate the quality of the output. And if we're getting very superficial, poor, unfact checked information, um, it's going to lead to very sort of superficial and poor behavioral responses from ourselves. So make sure that you are actually watching good quality. One of the kind of measures that I often take as a way to filter, I suppose, good from bad. I subscribe to a kind of slow journalism philosophy because the world doesn't change that quickly. And even if it does, we still need time to make sense of the events. So I prefer reading less frequently and going more in depth. You know, I think of, you know, this isn't my words. This is someone, Ralph, Ralph DeBelli, who's written a book called Stop Watching the News. He takes a slightly more extreme approach than me. But he says that breaking news is like bubbles on top of a water. But the real news is what's happening underneath that you know, what's causing those bubbles. And you often kind of only get that kind of storytelling when you go a bit more in depth, when you investigate the driving forces behind. It comes back to reporting on the process of change, giving yourself the opportunity to be able to better understand an issue. If you just look at the bubbles on top, you're going to have a very superficial understanding of the problem. The third one is to avoid clickbait. We know that news organizations will strap a shocking headline on top of an article to try and draw us into it. The problem is with that is it's not necessarily serving the best ideals of journalism or to our own selves as to you know what we should pay attention to and why we should pay attention to it. The more shocking a headline you see, the more I urge you to avoid it <laughs> and kind of look, if you are interested in pursuing it or understanding it, try and find it elsewhere in a more constructive setting. Number four is be prepared to pay for content. Well, there's no such thing as a free lunch. And if we're not paying for content, then somebody else is. And news organizations are ultimately going to answer to whoever pays the bills. So if news organizations are relying on advertising to be their main source of income, then corporations might be prioritized over consumers. In order to get around this, we have to pay for content. We have to support news organizations to enable them to become truly independent. So we should be, and it is valuable information when done well, so we should pay for it. There should be a value on that. The next one is read beyond the news. So we don't have to solely rely on news organizations to educate us on world issues. There are loads of other places that we can gain insight and understanding from you know, whether it's documentaries, you know, long form articles, any kind of science magazine. There's loads of places that we can actually go to tune in. Podcasts are great as well. And TED Talks are fantastic. That's a very good solutions focused news platform that helps us understand the kind of progress that's taking place, as well as very much highlighting the, the main problems that we face in the world. And then the last one is to seek out solutions-focused stories. And this is because we absolutely need a balanced media diet that includes solutions. And, you know, when we do start learning about solutions, we will become aware that the world's filled with incredible people doing incredible things. And it's up to us to find them, learn from them and be inspired by them. And if we can find these stories that inspire us to create change, we can change more than just the media. We can also potentially change the world.
And I feel it's a beautiful way to finish, but I, I'm going to finish with a beautiful quote by you in the book. And it says, it is essential that we as human beings feel empowered when facing challenges. It will be pivotal in whether we tune in or tune out. If we are to become empowered, then we will require three essential ingredients, self-efficacy, optimism, hope. And then you finish by quoting Desmond Tutu when he said, hope is being able to see that there is light despite all the darkness. And I feel you've definitely done this with this book and your mission is admirable and I support it greatly. And this show and our audience tip the cap to you, Jody, for your fabulous work. And I thought a nice way to honor you and finish today's show would be to play your manifesto that's available on YouTube. But before I do, where can people find out more about you and your work? On my website, jodyjackson.com, it has updates on how to look after our mental health, how to engage constructively with the news. Um, it has the starter kit on there. It talks about the movement. And it also, if you wanted to sort of sign up and leave your email address, then I'll keep you up to date with solutions-focused news stories and also changes in the kind of movement as it happens. The purpose of the news is to engage and inform, empower people to bring about reform, but their words are being lost by the noise of the storm. We hear about disaster, murder, conflict and violence, and after a while this becomes white noise like silence. Because when there's a bias for the negative, we lose becoming sensitive, and instead we become emotionally dead. You see, this negativity has been shown to be destructively informing me, dividing me from society by creating this fear and anxiety. For many, they watch helplessly as if we're damned to be. But that's not the only story of the fate of our humanity. Let's hear about progress, acknowledge solutions. This excess of negativity, it's like mental pollution. When we do see good news, it's misrepresented. We hear cats being saved from trees and the conversation is ended. Saved instead for an am finally. But finally, these stories of possibility are being shown to be a vital story for society. We need to learn about how problems are being solved, issues resolved, for the sake of our souls. Not for ignorant bliss, but because we are better than this. We don't need sugar coating or positive spins. Again, that's a cynical view that this conversation underpins. And don't get it confused with entertainment, PR or fluff. Enough is enough. It's rigorous journalism reporting on progress reporting on problems but not ignoring success. We publicize failure, corruption and shame but when it comes to human potential it's not treated the same and the hypocrisy is killing me. Are you kidding me? They point the finger at every other industry but leave them be. As this excess of negativity increases in velocity, atrocity, chasing more controversy but where is the nobility in preying on morbid curiosity? I feel cheated, defeated by newspapers allegiance to profits and clickbaits regardless of if it generates hate and drums up the nation into a fearful state. Some people find it too much to take. And then the stories become lost because people switch off. But if we want a nation that's engaged and informed, it's time to reform. Make a new norm, empower, inspire, help us achieve higher. Report the good in other people, not just replay their evil. If we witness the unbelievable, it makes it more achievable. A solution seems more feasible. The only option now is to freeze or fall. After all, the truth of the world includes the good and the bad, the happy and the sad. So why would you just tell one half of the story? It leaves us in mourning, unable to see that the new day is dawning. The power lies in us becoming aware to ensure they take more care about the stories they tell when they look at the world out there. And why should we care? Because the truth is the news is an organization that's intrusive of our minds. And it's a matter of time before their words become our thoughts, shaping our opinions more and more. So what we're asking for, as I've said before, is rigorous journalism reporting on progress, reporting on problems, but not ignoring success. It may sound idealistic, it's been labeled naive, but let me assure you, this is not an ignorant plea. The research says it's obvious and to ignore it is preposterous. So it's time for the consumers to take a stand because the industry will listen to us. Author of You Are What You Read, Jody Jackson, thank you for joining us. Thanks so much for having me.